good morning. Look at that instant hush, wonderful. Um, well, you'll be thankful to know that I'm not going to be standing up here speaking for a, uh, very long. So all I'm going to say is welcome to Bartram Trees. Thank you very much for coming. I know you're going to have a stimula stimulating and useful day. I hope you enjoy it. No questions. I would just talk about an email that was sent to me by Dr. Johnson. Johnston, I left the T out, sorry Mark. Um, where he said, Keith, sit back now. You've done your bit. I'm going to take over for the day. So anything that goes wrong from this point onward <laughs> is entirely down to Mark Johnson. So welcome. There's Barcham staff across the nursery. Anything you want, please just ask. So again, once again, thank you for coming and have a good day. Thank you. Good morning, folks, and uh, welcome to the Big Barn Conference 2014. I have to say, I have no recollection of sending that email at all. Uh, but uh, my job is to try and keep everything on time. Uh, we've slipped a little to start with, but uh, we will make that up in due course. I want to thank uh, Keith and Bartram Trees most sincerely for inviting me to chair this uh, Big Barn Conference, and this is uh, the third one I think I've done. And it's always an honour and a privilege because not only do we get an extraordinary turnout of people from the industry, but we get a wonderful lineup of speakers. And no exception this time. I think this is probably the best programme that's been put on here. We have quite an exceptional lineup of speakers from around the world. So many thanks to Barcham Trees for that. What a wonderful job they do. I'd also point out that this event is being held in association with the Arboricultural Association. I'm very pleased with that. Uh, and we thank them most sincerely for their support and the way that they've helped promote the event. And I'd also remind you that the main sort of theme of the uh, event today is the urban forest. And uh, the AA conference in September will be focusing on sustainability and the urban forest, uh, very much an echo of the sort of things that would be uh, talking about today. So if you visit the AA stand, you'll get the details of the conference and uh, I shall certainly be there. I'm uh, very pleased to be chairing the opening session of that conference and uh, it's going to be a great event. So uh, we'll be picking up on many of the themes we're talking about today. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if anybody's not feeling particularly well, there are first aiders over in the Bartram office. Uh, so. If you're, you know, if you're in need of that, that's where you'll find uh, qualified medical people. We should congratulate ourselves, all of us here today, because we're actually record breakers. This is probably the largest gathering of tree and landscape professionals ever held in Britain. We invited 550. I'm sure there's probably about 500 here today. And that's more than any other sort of conference uh, in terms of certainly arboriculture and landscape people that we've had here in Britain. So that's, uh, that's really, really uh, encouraging. I want to uh, just mention uh, something uh, rather sad as well, because uh, we've recently lost a very great colleague uh, in the arboricultural industry who's uh, well known to many of us and certainly well known to Keith and myself. Mike Volpe. I don't know if you're aware, but Mike passed away quite recently and was only uh, laid to rest yesterday. And uh, I, I, know, I knew Mike for quite a few years. He worked closely with me on Trees in Towns too. And uh, he represented the National Association of Tree Officers on that project. But all of you will have your own stories of, of working with Mike and, and, and I'm sure you would agree with me. What a remarkably nice guy and what a remarkably good arboriculturist he was and a very sad loss to the industry. So I'd like you to join me and Keith in standing up and just showing your applause for Mike Volk.
many, many thanks for that. That's a really fitting tribute to a great guy and a really great arboriculturist. Now I'd like to begin the, uh, the conference program by introducing our first speaker. Lord Framlingham was one of the earliest members of the Arboricultural Association, who later became a fellow and registered consultant. He's also a former president of the Arboricultural Association. Some of you uh, as old as me will remember Mike Lord, Michael Lord from previous arboricultural conferences. I certainly remember him from a conference in the 80s. Uh, he went on to become Member of Parliament for Central Suffolk from 1983 to 2010 when he retired. He was also Deputy Speaker of the House of Commons, was knighted in 2001. He's always had a great interest in trees and the arboricultural world and has recently been uh, speaking up in the House of Lords on behalf of uh, trees and the arboricultural industry. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Lord Framlingham. Well, good morning everyone. Uh, what a great pleasure it is to be at this big barn conference, which promises to be hugely interesting and uh, informative with a fantastic lineup of speakers, uh, all of whom I met last night and talked to until too late. I hope, to, I hope I haven't affected their performance today. But congratulations also to everyone who's had a hand in, uh, in organizing today. It really is tremendous. I'm so grateful too to Keith Saker uh, and Barcham Trees for giving me the chance to come to the conference and asking me to say a few words. Uh, perhaps you're wondering why someone from the world of politics should speak at a tree conference. I was going to explain, but I think perhaps Mark in his introduction has said quite a lot of what I needed to say. In the 1960s, I started and ran my own tree company, and I was in on the beginning, the arrival of Dutch elm disease from Canada, which is a long time ago. And as a consultant, I advised on the protection of trees when the Claw extension was built to the Tate Gallery, when a car park was built under London's Leicester Square, and when TV cables were laid under the streets of London. I was involved in the planning and planting of Milton Keynes. And as an expert witness, I dealt in the courts with amongst a huge variety of cases, all the problems relating to subsidence and clay subsoils, which I'm sure many people in this room remember well. I lectured in the United States uh, on England's ancient and historic trees. And it was there that I learned the value of lateral thinking on tree planting. When I saw ginkgos, which in those days were still quite rare in this country, being used as street trees, they were all over the place. In 1983, I became the Member of Parliament, as you've already heard, and now in the House of Lords, I'm able at last to speak about trees. I was Deputy Speaker for 13 years, and Deputy Speakers aren't allowed to speak about anything except to try and keep the House of Commons in order. Sadly, the, the recent Queen's speech made no mention of trees or forestry. So in the debate that always follows, I took it upon myself to raise the issue of trees particularly urban trees, which is what we're interested in here today. 80% of the population live in urban areas. And I started my remarks in that speech by saying what you already know, I'm sure. But I said, trees give us their grace and their beauty. They improve our air quality, particularly in inner cities, by taking in our carbon dioxide and giving us back their oxygen. They give us shelter and shade. They act as barriers to noise and dust. They resist flooding. They cool our cities and even help to calm traffic. In short, they massively improve all our lives. Now, whether in new housing developments which are coming up and down the country, or the redevelopment of Battersea Power Station or the effects of the new high-speed rail, huge environment impact this is going to have. It's vital that protecting existing trees 
and the careful selection, planting and establishment of new ones is given the highest possible priority. In all this, the government will not be short of advice and pressure. The Woodland Trust is determined not just to plant new woodlands, but to protect old and particularly ancient woodlands from threats posed by schemes such as HS2. TDAG, the Trees Design and Action Group, is a charity embracing a host of organisations and companies interested and qualified in the planting and care of trees in the urban landscape. The Natural Capital Committee advises the government on large-scale projects and the, and the national macroeconomic benefits derived from trees. The Arboricultural Association, which I was very much involved in, has in its members a wealth of knowledge about the practical aspects of planting and caring for trees and is often the first to spot signs of disease. The Forestry Commission has now to wear many more hats than it used to have to do. Just a few days ago, I was at some London Tree Awards and I heard an excellent presentation by its director, Ian Gambles, on the London iTree Eco Project, more of which I think we're going to hear later. This is the largest tree survey of its kind in the world and is expected to have a transformational impact on how London's urban forest is recognised and managed. And that brings me to the question of which government minister has the responsibility for urban trees. In answer to a parliamentary question I put down earlier this year, I was told no single government department is responsible for the planting of trees in the urban environment. I believe the time has come to draw all these threads together and to consider having an individual minister responsible for urban trees. Now, I want to say a word about biosecurity, about quarantine. The ravages of Dutch elm disease imported on logs from Canada in the 1960s robbed us all of our great elm trees. Ash dieback is now threatening to have the same terrible effect with diseased imported trees again involved and no remedy in sight except the depressing policy of managed decline. We have other problems of foreign origin threatening our native trees such as the oak processionary moth. moth. A disease of plane trees is now rampant in France, and I invite you all to imagine London, its streets, squares and parks, or any of our great cities, without their London plane trees. Box blight, of I think South American origin, is causing the ripping apart of some of our most famous gardens and has now been found in woodlands too. In southern Italy, a bacterial disease which hails from the Americas is sweeping through thousands of acres of olives. The truth is that modern trading in and transporting of plants has made the threat to our trees in this country, I think, frightening. And there are two things we must do. Firstly, we must grow more ourselves of what we can grow. But secondly, and more importantly, we must put in place with the utmost urgency a strict quarantine regime that will prevent plants being imported and immediately sold, scattered and planted all over the country. In answer to uh, another question, parliamentary question, I put down last July, I was told by DEFRA that the number of plants, bare root and container, imported into the UK in 2012-13 was very precise. 2,416,665. In 2013-14, that had risen to 3,064,388, an increase of well over half a million trees and plants. Unlike our European neighbours, where most of our imported trees come from, we are an island with all the biosecurity advantages that gives us. We should use them to the full. I acknowledge that there are some existing rules and regulations, but they are far from watertight, and that is putting it mildly. We must have a sensible quarantine system in place without delay. We don't have to devise it from scratch. Some nurseries, like Barcham's trees, are already implementing their own. And in addition to this quarantine, we must have rigidly enforced traceability. 
so that if need be, infected plants can be rapidly tracked down and destroyed. Now, I acknowledge the nation's tree budget is not in the same league <coughs> as defense or the NHS or education, but it must be substantial and it must be enough. It seems inevitable that as our country grows, growth now being everything, we must build, build, build. But if we want to keep the heart of our country for future generations, keep the hearts of our towns and cities, we must have the wisdom, the foresight, and the funding to plant, plant, plant our trees, and having planted them, care for them. Following the debate in the House of Lords recently, the Minister responsible at DEFRA for Trees and Biosecurity wrote to me to say that he thought my speech, quote, tremendously important. And he had, quote, taken on board the points that I had made. So we shall see. Rest assured, I will pursue them. Finally, it's good to be here with so many like-minded people. And I'm certain the conference is going to be a great success. I hope too it will contribute, contribute to and have an impact on all we are all trying to achieve. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Framlingham. That was uh, really encouraging and I can assure you that uh, everyone here today will be giving you as our full support in your efforts to raise the uh, the agenda, uh, trees on the agenda at that level. So thank you very much for that. Next up on the program is, uh, is my good self. Uh, I'm, uh, perhaps I should introduce myself, uh, but I'm sure many of you know me. Uh, and just to prove that there is life after Myasco College, I'm still here. <laughs> I've now retired, uh, although busier than ever, working from home uh, in Belfast and uh, Focusing now really on the, uh, on the historical aspects of uh, trees uh, in, in, in the urban environment. And this is really uh, the topic of, of my talk today. Uh, I have a book uh, which is actually being launched here today. Uh, trees in Towns and Cities, A History of British Urban Arboriculture. Uh, if you're interested in getting a copy, the publishers uh, have got a little stand here in that summer house as you uh, as you go out of uh, the barn and go towards the offices there, and I'll be signing copies of the book uh, at, uh, at the break times and uh, also at the end of the event, and uh, they tell me it's a special conference price of £25, so there you go. But uh, forget all that, because it's actually been a project of, of considerable interest to me. Uh, it started uh, because of a need to provide my degree students with uh, some background information on the history of trees in urban areas and so I started developing lecture notes and from that uh, got the idea working with a guy, uh, a colleague uh, Paul Elliott at Derby University, we had the idea of doing Britain's first book on the topic and uh, Paul uh, sadly got caught up in work so sort of dropped out and I think he's still working on a, on a book of his own but uh, I carried on and, and, and uh, developed the book uh, and it's been fascinating, absolutely fascinating research. And uh, as I say, you know, it's the first book on the topic. So hopefully, you know, it will start a, a lot of interest in finding out exactly where we've come from in terms of trees in urban areas. So it actually, uh, the scope of the book sort of ranges from, from the Romans right up to the present day. And uh, this is uh, a representation of the Roman town of Silchester. And, uh, we have some quite accurate records in terms of what was, uh, you know, in terms of the, the built uh, environment and open spaces and such, and uh, mostly trees actually in gardens around about that time, orchards and such, uh, no real sort of uh, trees to any great extent in publicly owned open space. As long as we've had trees in towns and cities, there's always been people designated to look after them. This is. Uh, an illustration from uh, William Lawson's book, New Orchard and Garden, first uh, published in 1618, uh, the first edition anyway, 
and shows people sort of doing various types of work in, in relation to trees. Some early pioneers of arboriculture. We look at how the whole sort of rise of professional arboriculture developed over the centuries. Most of us will recognize that the guy on the left, John Evelyn, and uh, his famous book, uh, Silver, 1664. This illustration is from uh, Hunter's edition, uh, Alexander Hunter's edition of Silver, which was 1776. Some say that's actually a, a much more valuable work with all the sort of footnotes and stuff. Uh, but I would suspect very few of you will have heard of the guy on the right, Moses Cook. Moses Cook was a contemporary of John Evelyn, wrote uh, a wonderful book, The Manner of Raising, Ordering and Improving Forest Trees. That's the first edition, 1676, a contemporary of John Evelyn. And uh, not very well known at all, but believe you me, a remarkable guy, and that's a remarkable book. And some authorities will actually tell you that John Evelyn got his horticultural knowledge from Moses Cook and a lot of the detail that uh, he picked up on. Uh, and he certainly knew him and went to see Moses Cook. He was the head gardener uh, to the uh, Earl of Essex. So uh, if you've not heard of Moses Cook before, there's a guy that's well worth uh, looking into. Some later giants of arboriculture, John Claudius Loudon uh, on the left here. I'm a huge fan of Loudon. Uh, the more I read about his work, I think, he, you know, if anybody is the preeminent giant of, of British arboriculture, that's your man. Not only in terms of trees, but public open spaces, greening of cities, all sorts of things. His uh, remarkable work, Arboretum Britannicum, eight volumes of it, one of the finest works ever written on, on trees. But uh, I say I, I'm endlessly fascinated by, by uh, his contribution to British arboriculture. A Scotsman and uh, an incredibly hard-working guy who basically worked himself to death in the end. On the right-hand side, another guy, uh, uh, this time an Irishman actually, William Robinson. Many of you from the world of horticulture and landscape will be quite familiar with William Robinson, well known as the father of the English flower garden. As someone who lives in Ireland, I always find that quite a I get a smile out of the fact that it was an Irishman who was the father of the English flower garden. But he actually had a huge contribution to the world of trees as well. And the more I, I read of his work and the influence that it had on our thinking in terms of trees and, and, and design, uh, quite remarkable. The rise of new technology uh, in a boriculture. On the left-hand side, this is a photograph uh, of the city of Paris safety belt, which was perhaps one of the first kind of uh, safety harnesses introduced into the country. And actually introduced by another giant of British arboriculture, probably the most uh, important uh, figure in British arboriculture in the first half of the 20th century, uh, Dennis Lasseur, I don't know if that's the name, ADC Lasseur, the care and repair of ornamental trees. Uh, a remarkable guy and uh, went over to Paris, got a lot of good stuff from the French, including equipment, and, and brought it back and introduced it at the city of London. Tree transplanting, we look at that and uh, how that's been carried out, not just in rural estates, but in urban areas by companies, famous companies like Barron's tree transplanting. Then we look at the rise of professional arboriculture in terms of professional representation how it took many, many years for a boriculturalist to actually be represented professionally. And it finally came about with uh, two organizations, the Association of British Tree Surgeons and Arborists. I don't know how many people here will remember that. 